Hallelujah. Make a joyful noise to the Lord. No joyful noise in you, huh? At least uh, make a, try to make a joyful face. Good morning. Uh, time to wake up. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks to God and thanks to choir for uh, lifting up our hearts to make joyful noise to the Lord. I believe that we are here to make joyful noises to the Lord. Amen. Today is, and there's, this is another reason to, for you to make a joyful noise. Today is the last study in Leviticus. It's a long journey of 17 weeks. And the title today, for today's study is Marriage Vow. Marriage Vow. Elder has read the first part and the last part of the chapter. And before we go, on, go into the details of the chapter, I'd like to ask you one question. Who is God to you? What kind of existence is God to you? What kind of being is God to you? Is he one that you love so much, so intimate and close? You want to spend time with him all the time? You want to tell him everything? You don't mind him knowing everything that you do from Sunday to Saturday, from 12 a.m. to 11.59.59 p.m.? Or is he like, he's like a father, but he's more like my physical father. I love him to no end. I respect him. But I don't want to really live with him. Or is he one, is he God, good God? I believe in him. But I feel a little bit more comfortable when there's a little bit of distance in between. I don't want God to know everything about me. I don't want God to be involved with everything that I do. Sometimes I want him to close one eye and turn his face once in a while. Or is he one who's just, who's just there as God of my religion his job is to provide for me and cater to my needs. If not, I can just kind of uh, start shopping for another God or another religion. Is he one whom I seek when I need help? Is he one that I come to seek, to find, say hi every Sunday, just to keep my religion, just to say I, I, I'm Christian? So... What, who is God to you? We need to, we need to be clear about that. If you are going to have relationship with Him, as the closing chapter, this Leviticus twenty-seven, God speaks about making a vow. He calls it consecration to the Lord, and tithing. Two things: making a vow and tithing. It is as if God is confirming an agreement and making it clear before he finishes this letter to his people. Let me be pessimistic for a little bit. Most of my week is pessimistic, but even on the pulpit, let me be a little bit pessimistic here. Hmm. It almost feels like God is saying, making all these promises so from chapter 1 through chapter 26, and then he says, okay, are you ready to, ready to sign before we finish? Sign this uh, agreement that you're going to give your life. Who's ready? We're at the last chapter, Leviticus, and God is saying, are you sure? Are you clear, clearly sure about this? About what? About this whole thing that I've been talking about, God says. About what? God says, remember, 
this Leviticus, the purpose of this Leviticus is so that you can come back into the tabernacle, which is my room, my master bedroom, so that you are qualified to come in and live with me. So God is saying, are you sure? Are you confirmed to live with me from now on? Can I hear an answer? I just need one answer. Are you sure? Are you ready? God's been talking about how His people can be redeemed to His presence. Are you sure you want to come back into the Garden of Eden? Are you sure you want to live with God now? That's why I took the liberty to call this chapter a marriage vow. I was wondering why God is closing this fabulous book of Leviticus with all these offerings and and forgiveness and keeping clean, the timings, uh, the appointed times of God, God's holy sanctuary, and then he finishes with vows and tithes, two topics that we don't really feel comfortable about. What do you mean? Are you saying I need to give commitment? Are you saying I'm tied down with this, in this contract? There are many people who stop coming to their churches because of these two things. Making a vow and because of tithes. But the purpose of giving Leviticus to Israel, once again, was to restore their dwelling in the house of God together with Him. Now God is telling His people, we are now family. Just as husband and wife are bound in a marriage, marriage covenant, through their marriage vows, God is confirming Israel's commitment and dedication to live with Him. And that promise is called vow. And tithe is the aspect of becoming one, sharing time, resources, and love together. So vow and tithe, vows and tithe, are confessions of our faith to God. What is that faith? In, according to the, the logic of Leviticus, faith means relationship, close relationship. Husband and wife take a vow when they get married. Marriage vow. That they will love each other and each other only. Right? When we take our vows, marriage vows, how many, how many percent are you promising? Although sometimes it ends up not in what we wanted. But the marriage vow is supposed to be 100%. You're not telling each other, okay, 50% of my lifetime I give to you, but the remainder I, I would like a refund, and I move on to the next one. That's not what we're promising. So they are making a promise that they will love each other only. No other man, no other woman. And that is a commitment for the rest of their life to each other. Hence, once they are married, under this marriage vow, they become one. They belong to each other. As a result, they begin to share their time, their money even, their heart, their everything. And so through, through these vows, God is making a promise with them, seeking for His people's commitment also. And please don't get me wrong, and don't get uh, Leviticus and God wrong. God is not forcing these vows upon them. These are voluntary vows. And through tithe, God is saying, we are joined together. We share. Although everything is from God, because God is the Creator, Although everything I have is from God, and when I say I am dedicated to you, I, I give my life to you, everything that I have belongs to Him also. But God says, you, you keep nine and give me one. 
And that sharing keeps us united together as family member. However, there are people who don't like that idea. What do you mean? I, I earn this money, I have to keep everything. Do you say that to your family members? Try saying that to your wife when you get married. Everything I have is mine, and you don't get to touch one. Every time, husbands, let me ask the husbands, when you take your wife and children out to dinner, do you feel like you're losing out? It's a loss, great loss of your income. Raise your hand if you think that way. We'll <laughs> throw stones at you. We don't, you know, husband or wife, but, you know, daddies don't go out to dinner with, their, with the family and say, okay, uh, this costs $200, so since we have four people in the family, each person $50. My wife needs to pay back within a week, but kids uh, are, don't have job right now, so I put interest on them, and once they start to work, when they get older, uh, this is how much they have to pay every meal. They don't do that. Do I sound like I do that all the time? <laughs> no, we don't do that. It's a joy of sharing together. Right? So the idea of tithe, when God is commanding it, He is saying, we are family. Actually, I want to give you more. But I just want your, your, one end, your end, your, your expression to say, what we have, we share together. It's yours. And eventually, such line becomes it's not like exact nine and one. We don't care, and eventually, whether I give five or ten, all belongs to him. We're one family. The more I give, the more he gives back. So it's a confession that he wants. So let us think about these two briefly. First point is, what is a vow? In today's passage, Leviticus 27 it refers to it as consecrating something, myself, my property, my offering, my animal, holy to the Lord. So what is given in vow becomes holy. What is given to God becomes holy. That's a vow. It speaks of four different cases of vowing. Vowing oneself, my life. That doesn't mean putting myself on the altar of burnt offering and burning myself. When I give, that's why God gave valuation to, the, to different things, to different kinds of people. Okay. Giving myself in today's terms and also uh, in, in the definition of God from God's perspective is living my life for Him and with Him. That's the dedication. So vowing, my, vowing to give myself second, or, or my family. Second is vowing to give an animal as an offering. Third, vowing to give his house as an offering. It's not that you're emptying yourself, uh, your house, and giving it to him in a burnt offering. You're using your house, and you're, you're giving him the valuation of that house. Fourth, a part of one's fields, of his own property, a part of the fields of his own property. So if uh, a person has uh, s several plots of land for farming, dedicating one to him. And how do you evaluate that land? The price of the land plus the seeds that are, in the, that are growing in the land. A vow is what I voluntarily promise to dedicate and give to God in response to the grace and blessings that He has given us. So it's not forced. But to me, what I vow to give to God reflects the cost and the price, the value, the weightiness of the blessing and grace that I have received. And when that relationship with God 
is pure and with true love, nobody has to force us, nobody has to calculate. We will know, I will know what I want to give to Him. It's like in a relationship. When, you have, when you're in a true love relationship with your husband or your wife or with your children, you want to give. It's, it doesn't end, but it doesn't stop by saying, I love you. It doesn't say, you know my heart. But when you really have that love, you want to show that heart in different ways. True, right? You have faces like you have never loved before. Are you agreeing with me or are you disagreeing with me? Have you ever loved to a point where you really want to express that love to that person? What do you do? You think about creative ideas. And what you put into that is you don't think it's too much. You never think it's too much. You always think, I want to do more. And so that's what God wants. Not out of force, not out of threats, not even for blessings, but because of love. I give this, if I give this, God will give me more blessing. Not that kind of calculation, but because of the blessings that I have already received from Him. So thankful that I want to express my gratitude. But interestingly, what the Bible tells us is, anything that is given to God is consecrated. And so it becomes, it, it becomes holy. So when I give myself to Him, I become consecrated and holy. And so if you want all of you to be consecrated and holy, what do you need to give? All of you. But then again, you know, that's not the purpose of giving here in this context. But what I have vowed, I must keep my promise. Vowing is a promise. Why? Because the moment I speak it, the moment I pray it, the moment I have it in my heart, God has received it. We sometimes hastily make a promise or vow when we are so fired up, so, so blessed, and they call it spiritual high. We, we make a vow, we make promises. And then when, after we cool down, we calm down, we come out of that high, we're like, oh my gosh, what have I done? We regret. So God knows us, and so God says, be careful what you say. Be careful what you promise, because once you promise it, I hold you accountable for that. So be careful what you say, God says. Deuteronomy 23, 21 through 23. Deuteronomy 23, 21 through 23. When you make a vow to the Lord your God, you shall not delay to pay it, for it would be sin in you. Uh, not, not making a vow and not keeping it. Until we pay it or we keep it, fulfill it, it becomes sin in us. And the Lord your God will surely require it of, of you. However, if you refrain from vowing, it would not be sin in you. So he's saying, it's better not to vow than to vow and not do it. God is being fair with us, right? And I'm thinking, God, if you say that, nobody's going to vow, right? Right? Nobody's going to make any promises with you because they're so scared. But then it doesn't go that way. I, I, as I was preparing for this message, I realized, let me ask you, you true Christians that really love God, can I ask you a question? Are you true Christians that really love God? Amen? Let me ask you a question. Yeah, is that okay? Are you going to answer me? Is it easier, or let me rephrase the question, is it harder to give to God or not to give to God? 
It is it harder to praise God or not to praise God? Is it harder to not believe in God or to believe in God? To, to Christians or to believers, children of God who really, really are in true relationship with Him and love Him, it is more difficult not to give Him anything, not to praise Him, not to come to see Him. So that's why God is not worried. But He says, don't make promises that you cannot keep. You shall be careful to perform what goes out from your lips. So once it comes out of your lips, you have to keep. So be careful what you say. Just as you have voluntarily vowed to the Lord your God what you have promised. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 25. Proverbs twenty twenty five. It is a trap for a man to say rashly, it is holy. And after the vows, to make inquiry. We cannot just make a change of mind after we promise to God and make a refund or seek for a refund. There's a story. A farmer, there was a farmer and his wife. And the husband, the farmer, tells his wife, I have made, to, made a vow to God to give one of the two cows that we have to him. They had two cows for farming. They used the cows to farm. And he said, I made a vow to give one of them to God. So the wife asks, So which one will you give him? The husband says, I have already made a decision in my heart, and I will give him, give that one to him. And then, not so many days later, there was a storm, and the barn collapsed, and one of the two cows died. The wife was concerned. She came to the husband. She said, Honey, we only had two cows. One is dead. And one you have vowed to give to God. What are we going to use to farm? What do you think the husband said? The husband said, Don't worry. The one that I had vowed in my heart is the one that's dead. Do you understand? So what's going on here? Did he change his mind conveniently? If he did, that's wrong. right? But if if it is really the, the cow that died that he had vowed in his heart, what do you do? What do you do? That's why Leviticus 27 says, these cows and animals and everything have a value. When you cannot give it, when something happens and you cannot give it, you give that much value to the Lord. You give, when when you make a vow and that you somehow find a blemish on that animal, you cannot give it to the Lord, then you you give that value, add one-fifth. So, let's apply that to us. We human beings, we were dedicated to the Lord in the Garden of Eden. But it went wrong. Something went wrong. Corruption took place. We became blemished. And somebody needed to pay that value. And what's that value? Paying that value is called redemption. You have to redeem for that. How much was it? God had put a value on you, on our foreheads. How much are you? God said, this one is valued. How much? Life of my son. That's what he paid to redeem for us. There are people who say something like this. When I sell my company... Or when, I, when this business goes through, well, successful, then I'll give a certain percentage of my profit to God. And when the company is sold, when things go well with the business, they conveniently forget the promise. And when they were approached 
by the pastor or by others, they were saying, I don't remember saying that. Or, oh, I was just talking. I wasn't promising. It was not a vow to God. We have to be careful because we know the story in Acts chapter 5 about Ananias and Sapphira. In in chapter 4, this man of faith named Barnabas sells a tract of land and gives the whole thing to the church. Barnabas during that time was very respected. He was not only wealthy, but he was dedicated to the church. Later he becomes Apostle Paul's partner in missions work. He was actually senior to Apostle Paul. Remember, his nephew is Mark. Anyway, they saw him doing this, so they made the promise. We will also do the same thing. We will sell our land and give it all to the Lord. Once they sold the land and had the money in their hands, other thoughts came in. Their minds changed. And so they gave only a percentage. We don't know how much. Only a percentage. Which is still good. But because of their promise to God, not to, they, not, it was not just to the apostles or church members. God took that promise as a promise to Him. And when they did not bring that same amount, God struck both of them to death. We might say that's too much. But God said, it's because you are lying to me. You deceive the Holy Spirit. This story shows us the weight of importance in regards to making vows. But what's important in our passage and for our understanding is that our vows are not necessarily limited to physical and material offerings only. The more important vows that we made and we are making are about ourselves and our lives to the Lord. One very important vow that we make and we have, most of us have made, is when we are baptized. When we are baptized into Christ and give our life, we are dedicating and confessing that we have died to our old selves and it is now Christ that lives in me. And therefore, I am His. We are people who have been born again in Jesus Christ and thus our new life belongs to Him. It's not just a ceremony. It's not just a certificate. It's not just a title. It's a promise. We made a vow with God. We made a vow that my life belongs to Him. And therefore, if my life belongs to Him, everything I have belongs to Him. Those of us who have been ordained are appointed as pastor, elder, elders, deacons, and leaders. We made our vows with God. We need to ask ourselves, am I keeping those vows? Or am I more dedicated to myself and my family and my things? What is, what is dedication here? How do we give to God? How do we dedicate to God? Micah chapter 6, verses 6 through 8. Micah 6, 6 through 8. With what shall I come to the Lord and bow myself before the God on high? Shall I come to Him with burnt offerings? With yearling calves, does the Lord take delight in thousands of rams, in ten thousand rivers of oil? Shall I present my firstborn for my rebellious acts, the first and the fruit of my body 
for the sin of my soul? But he has told you, O man, what is good? And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? The speaker here was saying, what kind of amazing offering should I give to the Lord? What is dedication? 10,000 ram, 1,000 rams? Or even my son for, to cover up for my sins? He says, no. What the Lord is delighted in is for you to do justice. What's, just, ju- what's justice here? Justice here is not talking about social justice. Justice here is following the word of God. To love kindness, to walk humbly with your God. That's the great offering that he's expecting of us. There was a man who was running a mechanic shop, a car service center, do you call it? Car shop, automobile shop, you know, fixed cars. And he was doing okay, but he, after he became baptized and became a Christian, he said, now as Christian, as a Christian, I need to change my ways. I need to be different from before baptism. So he decided to stop cheating. He decided to run his business with perfect honesty. Before, he used to tell his customers to change the part when it was not really due to change just so that he can earn more money. He would charge extra for different parts. But he stopped doing all of that. And after a few years, the word went around and spread. The customer's satisfaction went uh, increasing. And they started to talk, saying, this shop is very honest. And his business started to flourish even more. Again, the focus is not that the business flourished. The focus is, after his baptism, he decided to dedicate his life in some way to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with the Lord. Living my life with firm belief that my life is not mine anymore, but it is given to God. In Christ is my Lord. And that kind of life is the true dedicated life of a Christian. Secondly, and we only have two today, what is tithe? I'm not going to read the whole passage, verses 26 through 34. But God wants the firstborns first fruits, and he wants the tithes. Leviticus is God's instruction in how to live as true people of God. There are some fundamentals that need to be kept as people of God. What, what is different in us, in our ways of life, because we are children of God? Or is there no difference? God is the creator. He created the whole universe. And we are the receivers of his blessings and life. Just realizing that will start to make a change. The fact that I live because of God. God has given us a method to remind us of his presence. And he keeps on repeating and reminding us, you are mine. You are consecrated wholly to the Lord. And in the Old Testament, people of God had signs on their bodies. A person had a sign, especially men, had a sign on his body to designate it that that person belongs to God. And it's called circumcision. When you're circumcised, it doesn't mean only that part of your body that is that has a sign belongs to him. It's kind of funny. It means your whole body, your whole life belongs to him. Tithe carries a similar understanding. 
It's only one part out of ten that we give back to the Lord, to God. But it represents the whole. When the firstborn is given, the latter borns are also dedicated because the firstborn represents the whole. When we tithe and acknowledge that it belongs to God, tithing is an acknowledgement, act of acknowledgement that everything I have belongs to God. When we give that one, the rest, the nine, God says you can use. The rest is also sanctified. The rest, the nine, is also blessed. Do you understand this concept? And therefore, you will be able to live a much blessed life with the nine that is blessed than living with a ten that is not blessed. And God said, this one, you can test me. You can test me about this. So let us really think about and remember the promises we have made with God. Let us also think about our life of tithing. Who are the first ones that tithe to God? In the Bible, the first tithe that we see is given by Abraham to Melchizedek. And this was before the law was given. After defeating the allied kings and defending the land, he was coming down and he met Melchizedek and he gave Melchizedek one-tenth. The second tithing that we see in the Bible is by Jacob. Jacob was running away from his brother Esau. And remember the vision of the ladder that he saw at Bethel. Right? Running away, he, was, he felt rejected, he felt cheated, although he was the one who kind of cheated. He felt, he felt like, he, was, he felt lonely. He felt like there was no support. He received the amazing promise of the blessings, but he did not receive the blessings yet. He did not have anything yet. And it's that moment God appeared to him, God spoke to him, and he heard the voice of God saying, Jacob, I will be with you. Wherever you go, I will be with you. That was such a great consolation and confirmation for him. Jacob was so blessed, so inspired, he got up and used the stone that he was using as a pillow to set up the altar. And he gave sacrifice to God, offering to God. And he promised there, God, I will give you tithe. Because that tithe means part of me, part of what I have is you, is yours. Why? Because I know you're always with me. And these are in Genesis chapter 14, verse 20. And Genesis 28, verses 20 through 22. Verse 22, he says, This stone which I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. That's why it's called Bethel, house of God. And of all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. Common thing about these two tithes, Abraham and Jacob were of the times before the law was given, and so it was not forced. It was not a general rule or practice. It was a natural response when they encountered God. It was a natural response when they received answers to their prayers. It was a natural response, joyful response, when they really believed that God was with them, working powerfully in their lives. Once again, tithe was their confession that they believe and they know God is there in their life every moment. Let me ask you, is God in your life every moment? Is God walking with you? Isaiah 43 verse 1 
But now, thus says the Lord, your creator, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, he says, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, you are mine. God says, I have redeemed you. I have paid, I paid the, the price, your value for you. And so, he says, you are mine. Amen? Can we say it to the Lord? Lord, I am yours. Amen? So the overarching theme of Leviticus is God's message to his people. You are mine, and I am your God. May we be able to hear that in our life today. No matter what we are going through today. Just like Jacob, we might be running aimlessly, running away from something. But God says, even there, I'm with you. Wherever you go, I'll be there with you. There are many arguments and discussions about tithing today. Some churches even come out and say you don't have to. Whether you want me to say that or not, <laughs> I cannot say that because of this verse. Luke chapter 11, verse 42. This is Jesus speaking. But woe to you, Pharisees, for you pay tithe of mint and rue and every kind of garden herbs, and yet disregard justice and the love of God. These Pharisees tithe every little detail, even a little leaf of herb, they pay tithe. But they did not do justice. So which one should we do? Which one should we be like? Like the Pharisees that pay tithes for everything, but do not have justice and the love of God? Or should we have the justice and the love of God and disregard what the Pharisees were doing? What does Jesus say? But these are the things you should have done. Jesus is saying you should have done both without neglecting the others. Jesus is telling us, do both. You cannot just have the heart. And you cannot just have the body. He doesn't want only physical offerings. That's not what he's wanting. And that's not why I'm preaching. Nor does he want only lip service. I give you my heart. He wants the heart and love to move even the body in dedicating and giving to him. We're not talking only about dollar signs. We're talking about our life. May your life be consecrated. And by, by expressing our love to him, that is really genuine. May you, not only you, but everything about you, be consecrated and be blessed. Now as conclusion, only one question, only this one line of two questions. Let's ask ourselves, how close am I to God today? And how close do I want to be with Him? What kind of relationship do I have with Him? Do I want with Him? Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you because we believe that you have redeemed us and you have given us this new life. And Father, we have promised and we have confessed our love to you. Help us now to fulfill our promises by doing justice according to your word, by having love of you, and by following your statutes. Father, we pray that you will continue to speak to your people, those who are here and those who are not able to make it today. 
all of Zion Church members and their families. Please speak to them into their hearts and help them, help them to realize they are yours and that you will never leave them. And Father, help us to come into that love relationship, sincere relationship with you, and help us to understand your pure love and help us to express our love to you. Thank you so much for your grace. In Jesus' name we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. Let's give thanks to God.